Welcome to Whispers of the Guilty, where we unravel the darkest corners of true crime history and bring to light the stories that chill, challenge, and change us. I'm your host, Silence, and in today's episode, we dive deep into a tale that struck terror in the heart of Gainesville, Florida, and inspired a cultural phenomenon in horror cinema, the story of Danny Rowling, also known as the Gainesville Ripper. Our journey will take us back to the humid summer of 1990, when the small college town of Gainesville became the backdrop for a series of brutal crimes that would leave an indelible mark on its community and the entire nation. We'll explore the chilling sequence of events, the investigation that brought a monster to justice, and the lingering shadows these murders cast on both legal and cultural landscapes. Join us as we piece together the life of Danny Rowling, from his turbulent childhood to the execution of his gruesome acts and the subsequent manhunt that ended his spree of terror. We'll examine the psychological, social, and legal ramifications of his actions and reflect on how this case has shaped public perceptions of crime and punishment. Get ready for a compelling narrative filled with unexpected twists and profound insights, a true crime story that is as haunting as it is enlightening. This is not just a recount of horror, but a sobering look at human nature and justice. So, tune in as we shed light on the shadows of the past with the story of the Gainesville Ripper. Stay with us. In the sweltering heat of August 1990, Gainesville, Florida, a town celebrated for its verdant streets and youthful energy, became the backdrop for a series of events that would etch its name into the annals of American criminal history. This peaceful community, largely defined by the academic rhythms of the University of Florida, was about to experience a chilling disruption that would forever alter its narrative. The protagonist of this impending horror was Danny Rowling, a figure who would soon be dubbed the Gainesville Ripper. Before gaining notoriety for the brutal events in Gainesville, Rowling's life trajectory had been marked by a troubled upbringing. Raised in a turbulent household dominated by an abusive father, a strict and often cruel law enforcement officer, Rowling's formative years were steeped in violence and fear. This harsh childhood milieu not only alienated him from his family, but also set the stage for the development of his deeply disturbed psyche. As Rowling matured, his life became a patchwork of sporadic employment, aimless drifting, and frequent run-ins with the law. Despite attempts at normalcy, he was often pulled back into a vortex of antisocial behavior and petty crime. However, these early criminal acts were mere harbingers of the darkness that lurked within him. The first hint that something sinister was amiss in Gainesville occurred when two University of Florida students, Sonia Larson and Christina Powell, failed to show up for an appointment. Concern grew swiftly, and soon a horrific discovery was made in their off-campus apartment. The crime scene was a tableau of terror. Both young women had been brutally murdered and positioned in grotesquely suggestive postures, a signature that Rowling would continue to employ. The nature of these acts sent shockwaves through Gainesville, shattering the illusion of safety and community. Local law enforcement agencies, unaccustomed to dealing with crimes of such ferocity, were immediately mobilized. The police embarked on a desperate search for clues, hoping to capture the perpetrator before he could strike again. As the investigation unfolded, the community's unease grew into palpable fear. Parents hesitated to leave their children unattended, students traveled in groups, and the shadow of a predator loomed large over the quiet college town. Amidst this growing tension, Rowling's appetite for violence proved insatiable. Just as the town began to grasp the magnitude of the threat it faced, another grim discovery was made. Krista Hoyt, a 19-year-old student who also worked at the local sheriff's department, was found murdered in her apartment, her body displayed with the same chilling deliberateness as the first victims. This confirmation of a serial predator at large pushed Gainesville into the throes of a full-blown crisis. With each passing day, the Ripper's shadow grew longer over Gainesville the police, now racing against the clock, 
worked frantically to connect the dots between the crime scenes. Meanwhile, the residents of Gainesville wrestled with a haunting question. Who among them was capable of such calculated and monstrous acts? As the community braced for more possible attacks, the chilling reality set in. There was a methodical killer walking the streets, and no one was safe from the Ripper's grasp. In the immediate aftermath of Krista Hoyt's grim discovery, the University of Florida and the greater Gainesville area were thrust into an escalating state of terror. The news of a third brutal murder, following so closely on the heels of the initial killings, shattered any remnants of hope that the violence was a random, isolated incident. It was now unmistakably clear a serial killer was methodically stalking their community, and no one knew where or when he might strike next. Law enforcement agencies, led by seasoned detectives and supported by the FBI, doubled their efforts. They established a 24-hour command center, pooling all available resources to track down the killer. Psychological profilers were brought in, constructing a detailed behavioral blueprint of the suspect. They posited that the killer was someone with profound animosity towards women, likely fueled by personal traumas and a desire to exert control. This profile, while speculative, sharpened the focus of the investigation and guided the police in their hunt. The mood on campus and across Gainesville was one of deep anxiety and vigilance. Students altered their daily routines, nighttime gatherings were canceled, and many chose to leave town altogether. The local media coverage was incessant, broadcasting updates that both informed and inflamed the public's fears. This media circus reached national proportions, drawing spectators and journalists from across the country who were captivated by the unfolding drama. In this high-stress environment, the Gainesville police made a critical connection. They linked the Gainesville murders to an unresolved triple homicide in Shreveport, Louisiana, Rowling's hometown. This link was established through strikingly similar methods of murder and body positioning between the cases. With Danny Rowling now a prime suspect, his background was scrutinized, revealing a pattern of escalating violence that culminated in the horrific events in Gainesville. As the investigation deepened, detectives discovered Rowling's campsite in a wooded area near the university. This secluded site contained chilling evidence including tools possibly used in the break-ins and personal items that could be traced back to the victims. The most disturbing find was a series of audio tapes in which Rowling expressed his deep-seated hatred and frustration, sang about his deeds, and hinted at his reasons for the killings. The community's fear turned to outright panic as two more students, Tracy Pauls and Manuel Taboada, were found murdered in their apartment, bearing the same horrifying signature as the previous killings. This latest double homicide confirmed the worst fears of the residents and police alike. The killer was not only still at large, but also growing bolder with each attack. With critical forensic evidence now linking these crimes, including DNA and fibers from the crime scenes, law enforcement agencies knew they were on the right track. The manhunt for Danny Rowling intensified as police and FBI agents coordinated a large-scale operation to apprehend him before he could claim any more lives. As Gainesville grappled with the horror of five brutal murders, law enforcement intensified their manhunt for Danny Rowling. The discovery of Rowling's campsite had provided investigators with crucial evidence, aligning the chilling pieces of the puzzle. Inside the grim confines of his makeshift shelter, police found not only personal belongings linking Rowling to the scenes, but also disturbing diaries and recordings that offered a window into his twisted psyche. The recordings were a goldmine for psychological profilers, revealing Rowling's deep-seated rage and his desire to inflict pain and fear. These insights helped to refine the profile of the killer, portraying him as not just a predator of opportunity, but a calculated monster reveling in the terror he sowed. This understanding shifted the investigative strategies focusing efforts on anticipating his moves and capturing him before another attack could occur. Meanwhile, the city of Gainesville was in the grip of fear. The University of Florida campus was eerily quiet, as students who hadn't left town were implementing safety measures recommended by the police, such as traveling in groups and adhering to strict curfews. The usual vibrant nightlife of the town had dimmed, 
with streets deserted as dusk fell and local businesses suffering from the lack of foot traffic. In the midst of this tense atmosphere, the FBI and local police were putting together a comprehensive search operation. Rowling's identity was now at the forefront of national news, making it difficult for him to find refuge. His face was displayed on every news channel and printed in newspapers across the country as law enforcement agencies employed both traditional and innovative tactics to track him down. This nationwide alert bore fruit when Rowling was apprehended in Ocala, Florida, caught during a routine sweep for a minor robbery. Initially arrested under suspicion for theft, the matching fingerprints and subsequent DNA tests soon confirmed law enforcement's worst fears. They had caught the Gainesville Ripper. Rowling's arrest brought a collective sigh of relief from the terror-stricken community, yet the weight of his potential trial hung heavily in the air. The families of the victims and a scarred community awaited justice, seeking closure for the nightmare that had abruptly invaded their lives. As preparations for the trial began, the scale of Rowling's crimes started to become painfully clear. The evidence compiled was damning. A narrative constructed by forensic experts painted a picture of premeditated malice that was nearly unparalleled. Law enforcement officers, some of whom had become emotionally invested in the case, prepared to present a watertight case to ensure Rowling would face the full severity of the law. The community also began to rally, finding solidarity in their shared trauma. Vigils were held, and counseling services were expanded to help those affected cope with the psychological aftermath of the Ripper's terror. The university took steps to enhance campus security and review its protocols to prevent such tragedies in the future. As Gainesville tried to mend its wounds, the story of Danny Rowling was a grim reminder of the fragility of safety and the depth of evil that can lurk behind a human facade. The upcoming trial promised not only to deliver justice, but also to offer a chance for reflection and perhaps understanding of the darkest corners of the human mind. The trial of Danny Rowling, known as the Gainesville Ripper, began under the watchful eyes of a nation still reeling from the details of his heinous crimes. Held in the very town he had terrorized, the proceedings were a focal point for unresolved grief, lingering fear, and a community's craving for justice. The courtroom served not only as a venue for legal judgment, but also as a place for public catharsis. As the trial commenced, the prosecution laid out a detailed case against Rowling, supported by a wealth of evidence. The items retrieved from his campsite, the DNA samples linking him to the victims, and his own chilling recordings painted a vivid picture of premeditation and depravity. Each piece of evidence was a brutal reminder of the terror he had inflicted over those few days in late summer. Rowling's defense, in contrast, focused on his turbulent past, highlighting a childhood marred by extreme abuse at the hands of his father, a stringent disciplinarian who had been a police officer. His lawyers argued that his violent upbringing and subsequent mental health issues were mitigating factors, suggesting that Rowling was driven by forces beyond his full control. They posited that his actions, though monstrous, were the outputs of a profoundly damaged psyche. Despite the defense's efforts to humanize Rowling, the gravity of his crimes left little room for sympathy. The turning point in the trial came when Rowling, in a surprise move, pled guilty to all charges. This unexpected confession shifted the proceedings directly to the sentencing phase, eliminating the need for a jury to deliberate his guilt. In a courtroom charged with tension, Rowling's admission was met with a mix of relief and horror, relief that the legal ordeal was nearing an end, and horror as they were forced to confront the depth of his brutality directly from his own lips. The judge sentenced Danny Rowling to death for each of the five murders, delivering a verdict that resonated with the collective desire for justice, but also with the profound sorrow of the irreversible losses suffered. Outside the courthouse, the community of Gainesville began the slow process of healing, bolstered by the closure of the case, but forever marked by the events. The conclusion of the trial did not end the story of the Gainesville Ripper. Instead, it sparked a broader discussion about issues of mental health, the impacts of childhood abuse, and the effectiveness of the death penalty. Educational institutions nationwide took the tragedy as a cue to bolster their security measures 
and review their protocols to better protect students. Culturally, the ripples of the case extended into the realms of film and literature. The murders inspired the 1996 horror movie Scream, which not only brought the story to an international audience, but also prompted critical discussions on the glorification of violence in media and its impact on society. As years passed, the legacy of Danny Rowling's crimes continued to be examined in various forms, documentaries, books, and academic studies, each exploring different facets of the tragedy. These discussions often reflected on how society can better detect and support individuals showing early signs of violent behavior, aiming to prevent future atrocities. Gainesville itself underwent a transformation with the community finding new strength in its unity and resilience. Memorials were established to honor the victims, and annual events were organized to support crime prevention and mental health awareness. These acts of remembrance and solidarity showed a community not defined by its darkest moments, but by its response to them, a testament to the human capacity to seek light even in the deepest darkness. Thank you for joining us on this chilling journey through the shadows of Gainesville, as we revisited the harrowing tale of Danny Rowling, the Gainesville Ripper. As we close this episode of Whispers of the Guilty, we reflect on the impact that these horrific events have had not only on the victims and their families, but also on the broader community and our collective consciousness. Today's story reminds us of the fragility of safety and the depths to which human nature can descend. It also challenges us to think critically about the factors that shape such tragedies and the measures we can take to prevent them. As we continue to explore the darkest aspects of criminal history, we hope to foster a greater understanding of justice, rehabilitation, and prevention. If today's episode has moved you, or if you have thoughts and reflections on the case of the Gainesville Ripper, please share them with us. Subscribe to our channel for more deep dives into true crime stories, and don't forget to click the bell icon to receive updates on new episodes. Until next time, stay safe, stay curious, and keep seeking the truth. This is Silence, signing off from Whispers of the Guilty.